Hi, right, welcome back to Unit 2, Day 5, AP World History. Um, a reminder is to make sure you have your history notebook and you're taking notes as you move through the video. And make sure that you're completing the vocabulary for this video, which is on the next slide and, of course, down in the description. Key terms for today are Treaty of Tortolisse, Royal Colonies, Trading Post Empire, the British East India's Company, Seven Years' Volt War, Volta du Mar, Caravelle, and Cataract. Key concepts for today are going to be types of governance and characteristics of colonies set up by the Europeans, European wars, rivalries, and its effect on the colonies, and the effect of colonization. Now, before we move into the effects of colonization, we do need to talk about some technology. The Volta du Mar is a navigational technique developed by Portugal in the late 1400s and the 15th century. This, this is when they're going to learn to use the set wind cycles that the Earth naturally creates in order to navigate. Um, and their biggest one that they kind of use is the one on the right-hand side at the top that shows this constant wind current that they can use to kind of navigate. Uh, this is going to allow them to navigate to the, uh, the Indian Ocean, Africa, and eventually then the Americas. Now, the Caravelle also is used by Spain and Portugal in the 15th century um, to travel. Uh, it's a, a Caravelle is a small, fast, maneuverable ship that uses a lanteen sail that they got from China. And they also use what is known as a beating method to go indirectly against the wind. So they're not solely dependent on the wind for navigation. Now, a Carrack, a Carrack is a larger than a Caravelle ship. It is square rigged. It's more for distance sailing. And this is going to be used in the 15th century by Portugal. Now, global exchanges. The bi this is the big biological exchange between the New World and Old World, where they, where they, the Old World and New World transfer diseases, food, animals, and farming techniques. This is known as the Columbian Exchange. Now, the Columbian Exchange does not only affect Europe. The foods and animals that are brought to the Old World by from the New World reach as far as uh, China, the Indonesia, uh, eventually it'll even reach Australia. It reaches really globally, and it's not just between the Old World and the New World or Europe and the Americas. But it's not only there's not always positive things spreading during this way. Endemic diseases such as smallpox, measles, diphtheria, whooping cough, and influenza are going to ravage the Americas and the and diseases from the New World are also going to hit the hit the old world. And between 1500 and 1800, 100 million people are going to die from imported diseases. Again, some of the food crops and foodstuffs that transfer over. We have wheat, horses, cattle, sheep, goats, chickens go to the Americas. And American crops such as maize, which is corn, potatoes, beans, tomatoes, peppers, and peanuts go to the Old World. And due to the increase of food in the Old World, because these are easy to grow, we see a population increase from 425 million in 1500 to 900 million people by 1800. Well, with all this new population, they have to go somewhere. And the Columbian Exchange also includes the transfer of people from the old world to the new world. Uh, the biggest transfer to the new world from the old world are going to be enslaved Africans, uh, which are going to be the largest group transferred from 1500 to 1800. So here's a picture of the uh, Columbian Exchange. It shows what is what goes from the... Americas to the Old World and from the Old World to the New World. These are foods and animals. This isn't the full Colombian exchange. Now, colonial expansion. You can really kind of set... This is in the Americas. You can really kind of set the two biggest colonial expansions during this area. It's going to be Spain and Portugal. Spain kind of starts it off with the Caribbean. In 1521, they're going to invade what is modern-day Mexico. And in 1531, they're going to invade what is modern-day Peru. Their biggest rival in the region, P Portugal, is going to try to colonize Brazil, and they will colonize Brazil, but there's a problem. Now they're rivals, and the Pope steps in, because they're both Catholic, and they said, hey, I'm just going to separate the world in half, and 
This is known as the Treaty of Tordesillas, where Spain gets the left half, the Americas, and Portugal gets the right half. They get the Africa and the Indies, and Spain gets most of the America minus a portion of Brazil. Both Spain and Portugal are going to be direct rule royal colonies with colonial administrators sent out from Spain and Portugal. Now, the goal of Spain and Portugal is to make money and to convert the native population to Catholicism. So, what does that mean? Well, that means that very rarely is Spain and Portugal going to have a large portion of Spanish and Portuguese in that region. They're going to be more slaves and American Indians. Now, on the other side, which is kind of the opposite of Spain and Portugal's motives, we have the French, Dutch, and English, who are, yes, in it to make money through joint stock companies and setting up those kind of colonies to make money, but they're more setting up for settlement. They're wanting to live there. They're going to be one of the ones who are, we're going to import tons of people to these places. We're going to settle. We're going to make a country or make colonies so we can expand our holdings. Um, and this is kind of encouraged by the French, Dutch, and English through land grants. And there was a really for colonization. Um, and due to this, the Europeans, especially the French, Dutch, and English, in order to live there, they're going to drive off the American Indians. Now, let's move on to trading post empires. Uh, now, Portuguese are going to be the big ones in the Indian Ocean for this, and this is really where trading post empires really kind of spring up is in the Indian Ocean. The Portuguese are really going to build, really going to set this example. They're going to build 50 plus posts between West Africa and East Asia. Uh, and really, it's going to be predominantly Portuguese controlled by the late 1500s or 16th century. Well, then move in the English and the Dutch. Um, the Dutch kicked the Portuguese out of South Africa and they set up Cape Town and they also set up in Indonesia and in modern day Java. The English then come in, they kick the Dutch out of uh, South Africa and India. Then they kick the Portuguese out on the eastern coast of Africa. And really, the English really began to kind of really kind of take over. Now, the English are going to create, and the Dutch are going to create efficient commercial organizations known as drunk stop companies. And again, this is when you have several people who buy a share of a company and they get those that share of profit back. You're also going to see the rise of insurance companies where companies arise to insure these trading ventures in order to make sure that um, that they get there and their money and the investor's money is protected. Now, we have two biggest uh, joint stock companies is going to be the British East India Company, founded in 1600, and then you have the United East India Company, or the VOC, founded by the Dutch in 1602. And these are going to be the two biggest ones that you're going to see over and over again, especially the British East India Company. Now, again, the Europeans in the Indian Ocean, the Portuguese controlled the area initially. They were the first ones there. They are the first contact. They're setting up everything. Then the Dutch come in. The Dutch are like, Portuguese, ha, you thought you were good at this. You're not. We're going to take over. And then the English look to the Dutch and be like, ah, nope, you're bad at this too. And they kick the Dutch out. Uh, now, kind of France is also once a piece of this. So the English are going to fight the France over India. Right? This establishes the British East India Company, who then goes to the king. And the king is like, and he goes to the king's like, hey, we're making you a lot of money. Can we have the Royal Navy to protect our stuff? And 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 you can fight the French too. And the the king's like, that sounds like a perfect idea. And so the British kind of roll over France in the in India and in the Indian Ocean. The Spanish con conquer the Philippines. That's not where the profit is, so the English don't really care. The Dutch really only can kind of conquer Java because they were kicked out of everywhere else by the English. Right? Well, of course, this is going to create commercial rivalries. And due to increased global competition, of course, if you're if there's money involved, people are willing to fight and die over it. Right? The Dutch kick all the Portuguese out of Southeast Asia. 
right? Then the then the English come in and kick the French, the kick the kick the Dutch out, and then the English and French are sitting there fighting over India. This leads to, well, when the English are fighting the Dutch, this leads to the Anglo-Dutch Wars. Anglo meaning English, English-Dutch Wars. Right? You have the War of Spanish Succession, which is going to kind of cripple the Spanish um, power in this region and kind of really keep them to their holdings in the Americas and uh, the Philippines. And, of course, the Seven Years' War, which is the one you uh, are going to need to know the most, is going to be between the French and the English in the Americas and at sea. And, well, the English are going to win. And what's the outcome of all of these things? The outcome of all of these is that the British win. And the British really begin to control this vast country, this vast network of colonies and trading outposts. And this is where the term, the sun never sets on the British Empire, comes from, right? Because the British control India, Canada, Florida, most of the Americas, up to the Appalachian Mountains on the eastern seaboard. The Dutch are allowed, allowed to keep certain places as long as they were allies with the English and paid them a portion. Right? This is really showing that the British have the power. Right? Now, other in, in other places in Europe, the Prussians' armies are holding up massive armies. They're really beginning to show their military prowess. But again, war paves the way for the British Empire in the 1800s, 17 to 1800s. Right? By 1750, British is the strongest nation in the world. They have the land, they have the sea, they have the money to back it up. Right? And they really don't lose until the American War for Independence. And that's when they really start to crack, but even then they maintain most of their supremacy well into the 20th century. So that's where I'm in for today. Please make sure that you're following along with your notebook and you're completing the vocabulary for this video, which is at the beginning of this video and down in the description. Thank you guys, and I'll see you guys in class.